Hi, welcome to Bear Mountain. Uh, today we're doing a video and it's kind of in response to a lot of questions we got on a previous video we did on planting our anemones. And it's about our crate system and how, how we run it and how we protect things during the winter. And so we thought we'd just kind of give a little primer on some of the basics that we do here. What you're looking at here are our, our anemones as they were planted about, oh, I guess it would be uh, 10, 10, 12 days ago. Um, they're just now starting to put out their first set of leaves on this side. The other side over here, these were um, anemones that were left in the crates and simply um, refertilized. And so our objective here is to see if we can get things running a little faster than what would be normal. Um, so questions about the crates. First of all, these are bulb crates and they're nine inch deep and they're about 16 inch wide and about 22 inch uh, in length. Uh, what we have these resting on is, um, well, first of all, we designed this crate house years ago. It was the first thing we did. Uh, we had no metal at the time and so we used PVC pipe. It's like one and a half inch pipe. Uh, and this width of this house is about 12 feet. So it's just about big enough to, you know, get a, uh, a set of crates in here uh, down the center and leave a bit of room on the side to walk around. The uh, house has actually been pretty robust. Um, it's gone through several major snowstorms and windstorms and things of that nature. It's a typical caterpillar style tunnel and it's worked out pretty well. Now the basics of how we plant these guys in the crates is uh, these crates are suspended above the floor which has a, by the way, has a fabric, landscape fabric on it. It's a little dirty right now. We have to clean it up, but uh, it's a weed barrier to keep anything from growing uh, directly under it. And then the, uh, there are concrete blocks. And then on top of that are four foot by four foot pallets that we got from uh, a local supplier. And, and uh, we just got those dirt cheap and <clears throat> we put the pallets on top of the concrete blocks and then each pallet can hold approximately six crates. That's kind of how it works out, a little plus or minus a little room. So the length of this house, house is 85 foot, and we have uh, approximately 120 crates in here at any one time. And uh, we are, after this year, we're going to be replacing this tunnel and putting in actually a steel structure uh, that will be wider and uh, ultimately be able to have two of these types of rows in it and still have room to walk around the side. The reason why we went to crates instead of planting these directly in the ground was um, twofold. The first, um, years ago when we started this, we used to raise quite a few lilies during the uh, season from basically May through frost in September. And the anemones were a great um, crop to rotate in so the crate system would constantly have something in the house running and that's what kind of got us started on it but the other thing that we noticed was that um, it helped us I think control a little bit better on temperature and uh, without being in the cold wet ground and being suspended above we could easily put fabric cloth as you can see these plastic hoops we can put a fabric cloth over the hoops almost all the way down to the ground. So we get a insulation, a minor insulation from the plastic when it's all the way down and the ends are sealed up and then another layer of insulation over the top. Which just, it, just to clarify that fabric cloth is actually Agrabond 50 frost yeah. blanket. Right. And we're using 10 foot uh, wide uh, Agrabond 50 which you can get. We'll put some links down in the show notes of where you can get it. Uh, East Coast versus West Coast. And uh, that really kind of helped us kind of, kind of, I think, get pretty good production out of it. And once we kind of got it dialed in, in a sense, it's kind of a legacy system. I'm not saying that, you know, planting anemones in the ground uh, doesn't have its benefits. Um, it, it does, it, as long as we don't have rodent problems. Rodent problems are pretty big around here, too. This crate system hasn't stopped the rodent problem 100%. We still do get some incursions because the little, the little uh, guys can climb. Um, but um, it definitely uh, slowed them down a lot because it's not at ground level, so they got to think about climbing. And then um, once we clean out, the reason we haven't got this cleaned out yet is because we are replacing this house. 
but in a normal year this is like scrubbed pretty clean and there isn't anything you know laying around um, so the further away uh, that the rodents have to climb the less likely they do so I'd say our losses from rodent damage vary from year to year sometimes the rodent pressure is really big all around the farm uh, the last couple of years it's been it's been pretty uh, pretty mild so we've been lucky from that perspective we have feral cats that uh... Hunt and we encourage them by uh, bribing them with extra food so that they can spend time here in our tunnels and they do a good job working the uh, mice and voles also. Yeah, since we're not raising food um, the, and the cats really haven't done any damage like rolling around on things too much. Um, surprisingly the weirdest thing we had happen just happened a couple of weeks ago and uh, we came in one morning and there was hoof prints in the crates so uh, we hadn't closed up the ends at at night because we were just trying to keep uh, some good ventilation going and we didn't put anything over there to block the deer. We've never had any problems with deer coming in here before, uh, but uh, one of the enterprising critters decided that he was going to get up on top of this, or she, and just kind of walked around and took a few nips here and there. Didn't really eat anything, but pile drive uh, quite a few of our... Um, anemones down the lower end of the crate house but uh, we were able to recover from that so in the future that's one thing to think about is deer will eat anemones um, and so you need protection from that too and that's another reason we raise these things not out in the open but in an actual structure the other issue is in the these are going to start blooming in probably February uh, sometimes as early <laughs> as early as mid-January and the weather around here in Western Oregon in the wintertime can be, we can have an incredibly mild winter in which we really get no snow or ice or anything like that. And then we can have some winters where, gosh, we just get hit and then maybe a couple weeks later get hit again. We don't tend to stay frozen. So this is an unheated hoop house. So when we get into a freezing event that might last seven to ten days, we will double coat these guys with uh, Agrabond which will give us protection usually down to you know nine or ten degrees and anemones tend to be pretty robust anyway on their own so um, we have had very little damage uh, re related to the actual temperatures uh, again the agrabond is the key uh, and putting it over these hoops you don't need as much as strong um, you know as you would out in the field in terms of you know tying it down and all that kind of stuff so it's the it, it works out real well. And then um, one of the other questions that folks had was, well, okay, what do you do for the soil? Well, the soil is basically it's a blend of our own soil on the farm, plus compost, plus peat moss, and, and then we uh, supplement it with minerals and also some fish bone meal. Uh, so we try to keep the fertility of the crates up pretty high. We don't dump the crates at the end. We'll come back if we need to and dig the anemones out, um, but we will constantly keep amending the soil in the crates itself. And if the crates, you know, some of the dirt maybe filters out down below, um, we'll add a little bit more if we need it. But this is a really high organic material um, type mix, and it seems to perform well. The drainage is good. Um, we don't seem to have any problems with that. The um, thing about it some people can raise them in peat a mixture of peat perlite maybe a little bit of sand and something like that that'll work too it's just that we just have to happen to kind of migrate to this methodology um, it kind of seems to work the plants are healthy uh, especially as it cools down they get even greener um, and, and so they they uh, seem to thrive pretty well and we get pretty good harvest out of it the next thing you may note is saying, okay, well, how do you irrigate? <clears throat> we have this house split into two zones, and we're thinking that when we change the house out, we're going to actually split this into four zones because we're going to extend this house out another 15, 20 feet. Uh, and so we're going to have more crates. And so one of the things we noticed with um, you know having about a 45-foot irrigation zone is that in some cases we're getting way too much more water at one end versus another. And since this is kind of somewhat on a slope, it's, it's got some issues related to that. But the key to watering crates that we found is, is the drip tape you want to use 
is uh, emitters spaced on four inches. And that will give you more emitters per crate and we run three strips on the crate. And it's pretty simple. Um, we like to keep it, you know, towards, you know, the ends and the center. Um, we just use some wire and maybe pin it in the middle and then on the ends we'll zip tie the ends to the, la the back crate so because drip tape likes to uh, move around quite a bit um, and that seems to work pretty well for us. So there's two irrigation headers up there where the drip tapes connect to and we'll just water one zone at a time uh, and see you know how things are going. Sometimes we need to water the front zone and don't need to water the back one it just kind of depends on you know how things are going. Um, so I think that kind of covers the basics of the questions that we had. We've also uh, considered that, it, that we could possibly use an insulation board underneath them if it was a case of super cold. That was another thought we had um, and we kind of we haven't executed on that one yet because we just don't have the consistent cold that maybe somebody in the Midwest gets. Um, but so, it's something to consider. But it would, I think, yeah, if you got something like, um, if you could put like a one inch or one and a half inch insulation, something that's R19 or something, you know, something like that foam board you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that, and put that um, underneath to kind of give a little more insulation from the cold creeping in. But what we found is, is again, kind of these guys are pretty robust. They can take pretty low temperatures. You know, they say only 28 degrees, but in reality, we've seen these guys down in the low 20s, and they're okay. Um, now, they actually you have... seem to prefer cooler. They start to shut down in May when it gets pretty hot in here, even if we're completely vented open. Okay, one of the other questions, and Denise, that's a good point bringing up, is what do you do when it gets hot in the hoop house? Um, we vent up the sides uh, as far as we can get them. So usually on the side in this kind of caterpillar thing, we can get the sides up three to four feet. Uh, we'll also open up the ends so we make sure we have good airflow all the way around. Then the last thing we'll do to um, kind of maybe stretch the season a little bit longer and we typically can get a couple more weeks of, of harvest out of it is we'll put a 30 percent shade cloth over the top and, and, and it makes the plant stretch a little bit more but it really takes off in a peak temperature during the day probably 10 to 15 degrees which is huge because once these guys get to about 80 degrees like if you have three or four days of 80 80 plus degrees they shut down and they shut down fast um, so it's definitely a cool season flower. Yeah. And you'll know you'll know when they're shutting down because the stems will get so thin, and the plant leaves start looking yellow, and uh, it's just uh, you know it's over. So we then in the summertime, what we do with these crates is we haven't found a good crop to rotate in yet. Um, we moved away from the lilies. We moved away from the lilies, and that was simply a market issue, and for so us. for us. And uh, so we are still kind of struggling to try to find a good rotation crop that would work. in. we tried some annuals, you know, like maybe do some uh, mini sunflowers, you know, um, packed Celosia. in real tight, and celosia. And then we also tried some basil, some some things that like some heat, like uh, basil and. Uh, it just just wasn't working out that well for us so still thinking so we're still thinking on it. so that is the downside to it is it's dedicated space and unless you get a good rotation to put in here and since we're going to be expanding this we've got to definitely find a good rotation that would help us you know get something during the summer in the summer months so hey if you guys got any suggestions you know post them in the comments because we're, we're open we're open to new ideas on that well, I hope this answers a lot of the questions. Um, There's 21 corms per crate. Oh, that was the last thing. Yes. How many corms in a crate? 21, 21 corms. And Three rows of seven. Have we ever tried it with ranunculus? No, we haven't tried it with ranunculus. Um, and I, I don't think that it, it, it's not that it wouldn't work. Um, I think it's just more along the lines of... Uh, because this was a rotation crop with lilies, we didn't really weren't thinking about, you know, going into crate production. But we know that there are people who've done it and been quite successful with it. It would just probably have less 
than 21 corms in it. Yeah, I'm not sure what the count would be, but you might be thinking because because of the nature of ranunculus are pretty big, you might be looking at more like 10 to 12 good sized corms in, in a crate. Uh, the other thing is, is with uh, your ranunculus, you will definitely have to net them because uh, they will get floppy. And so in order to keep you know, the stems upright, you're gonna have to rig up a system you could actually, if you were using metal hoops instead of plastic, you could put a hoop system in here and then put the Hortonova, stretch it across in the hoop system. Um, we'll demonstrate that probably a little bit later when we are uh, doing our fall snapdragons, but it's really pretty simple. Uh, we learned this idea from Florette, so credit where credit's due. It's something Chris Benzakeen came up with, and I think it just works really well. Okay. So we covered 21 corms in a crate. We talked about the soil mix. We talked about the irrigation. One of the last things we want to cover here is where do you get the crates? Well, the crates are, for us, have been an accumulation of how many we've gotten over the years because we used to buy a lot of lilies and every time we got lilies, they came in a crate. Daffodils. And daffodils, they come in a crate. So basically every time we bought bulbs on a wholesale basis, they came in a crate. And so we um, were able to accumulate quite a quite a few that 15 way. 15 years worth or 14 years worth of bulbs. So if you're just starting out how where to get them you might ask depending on where you are in relationship to a bulb distributor if you're within driving distance of one you might ask if they have any spares because sometimes these guys are swimming in them too. Um, cost of them could be anywhere I'd say two to three bucks would be a reasonable cost if they're in good enough shape. Um, these things seem to last forever they're pretty uh, indestructible and um, the other thing is maybe if you belong to the AFCFG or some other kind of forum like on Facebook, ask around if some of the more, you know, long-term uh, long growers have <laughs> excess crates. You know, every once in a while somebody says, I got 300 of them, just come and get them or something. I um, mean, you see those kind of opportunities come along. And so if you can do that, um, that, would, that would work. The other thing is, is if you could find, you know, a similar type, it doesn't have to be a bulb crate. Maybe you can find a different kind of crate that uh, works for you. It doesn't have to be super deep. I mean, these are only nine inch deep. And like I said, they're 16 by 22. So that works for us in our context. Maybe it work uh, something different. So uh, I want to thank you for watching today. Hope this answers a lot of the questions. Be sure to check out the show notes down below. We'll put links on to where we got some of these things like the drip irrigation and that sort of stuff. And also, too, uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Uh, it should be a logo in one of the corners, depending on where it is. Uh, and just click on that, and that would get you to, uh, to subscribe to our channel. We have lots of good videos out there. And also, too, um, you know, check out our website and our blog because uh, sometimes we, we have other more detailed information that we can't get into the video itself, but might be helpful. And we have lots of anemone videos and uh, blog posts, so hopefully something in there will help you out. So I want to thank you for watching today, and have a good day. Thanks.